Congress. A man is about to get on a plane. Suddenly, he changed his mind. An hour later, the plane crashes. It's a chance. Northern Texas. A UFO was reported by a dozen people. Although there were no storms, it dismissed as lightning. Time Life Books announces mysteries of the unknown. Important news series that goes deeper into the world of mysterious and unexplained phenomena than ever before. It uncovers the secrets and tells you everything that can be known. Stonehenge. A visitor shapes a wire antenna in an ancient symbol and points it at the stone. A surge of power knocks him unconscious. Was it all in his mind or much more than that? Experience mysteries of the unknown for 10 days free. Then decide if you want to dismiss it. Call 1-800-272-6800 to examine mystic places for 10 days. Keep it a page as 1299 plus 298 shipping and handling. Other books will follow. What about every other month? Cancel anytime. Call 1-800-272-6800. Piedmont Airlines is selling hundreds of beautiful chairs for next to nothing. Like this one. Chic, sophisticated, perfect for the big city. A steal. Here's a popular little number. This chair for the beach. Why, you can even rustle up a bargain on this classic western look, Pilgrim. Tickets are non-refundable and not available on all flights. Other significant restrictions apply. You better hurry. These chairs are going to go. Go. Get ready for Mazda's 89 lineup. Your Mazda dealer has something for everyone, like the Red Hot MX-6, luxurious 929, practical 626, and fun to drive 323. Get set with Mazda trucks, rate number one in customer satisfaction for three years running. Go oh, get the feel of an 89 Mazda now. Get a great deal at your local Eastern New England Mazda dealer today. We will return to Crimes of Violence in a moment. Just four little calories. Molly McButter. Molly McButter. 100% natural butter flavor sprinkles. Real butter taste. Four little calories. Go on, indulge. Molly McButter. Do you wear dentures and smoke like John? You can be a fresh mouth, too. With Mint Fresh Smokers Polydin. Its super strength cleans tough tobacco stains. Its minty mouthwash ingredient freshens up dentures. Try Smokers Polydin. A mouth freshening clean. The allure of expensive perfumes is irresistible. Now discover the allure of new Ara designer fragrant antiperspirants, similar in scent to some of the world's finest perfumes. Samara, a classic oriental scent. Caprios, an exotic floral. Verona, a spicy oriental. And Marseille, a delicate fresh floral. All with arid protection against wetness and odor. Four alluring new Ara designer fragrant antiperspirants. They make getting a little closer a little nicer. Midas brake shoes and pads are guaranteed for as long as you own your car. And that's just part of our $79 brake special. Nobody beats Midas. Nobody. It's Captain Midnight! Brought to you by Ovaltine. Remember, to do your best, you've got to be at your best. Because someday you may be called upon to pilot a jet plane across the continent to take the wheel and bring a great ship safely into port to drive an ambulance to disaster areas. That's why I want all Secret Squadron members to drink Ovaltine every day. Here's an important Secret Squadron message. Classic Ovaltine's back in chocolate malt and original malt flavors. And still available in rich chocolate. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ron Harris. Well, we started the day in a fog, then turned out almost decent for a little jog, huh? Let's take a look at what's coming up in our weather. The satellite loop showing us a lot of moisture, and we're out ahead of that going to run for 70 degrees tomorrow, but heavy thunderstorms out in Illinois during today. Golf ball size hail out that away. We'll have some showers heading in our direction, maybe even a rumble of thunder tomorrow night. More time. This program contains graphic scenes of violence and language which some may find offensive. Your discretion is advised. Human being by another. Five years of age. As for the victims, eight out of ten murdered men are killed by men, and nine out of ten slain women are killed by men. While well, some of these killings occur as part of a burglary or robbery, a greater percentage occurs after arguments or on impulse, a spontaneous, deadly attack, like the case you're about to see. Ernie Rue, 28, 
convicted of first-degree murder. Carl Dill, Jr., 20, Rue's half-brother, convicted of second-degree murder. David Abbott, the victim. He was 29 years old when he was killed in 1983. David and my daughter had a real special relationship. And I've been divorced for years. And basically, David was her father figure. She looked up to him. She respected him. He had a wonderful sense of humor. But he was deep. He loved sincerely. And he was honest with his love. I guess that's, I miss that the most. It's terrible to say you don't appreciate someone until they're not around. And you don't realize what an impact they have. And at least, you know, I can sit here and, and think, David, you did. You meant a lot. And you, some of the things that, he, you know, he said and did, well, I look at my daughter, she'll never forget them. I mean, they were so important to her, important enough that she feels that her uncle was a great person. Due to the nature of this crime, Carl Dill Jr. was tried as an adult, even though he was only 16 years old. The brothers entered pleas of guilty and are now cellmates in maximum security. Their version of the murder is the only one we have. Well, it started off to be with the was a night on the town, you know, with my brother and, uh, and this girl. We're at the bar, we're drinking, I'm ordering drinks, you know, as fast as they'll drink them, I'll buy them another one. I had the money, it didn't matter to me then. And then we meet this guy, Abbott. And, uh, he seemed like a nice guy, he was drunk. But, uh, we were playing pool with that guy for drinks. But then we found out he couldn't afford his drinks, so I bought him drinks anyway. Um, after a while there, I uh, gave the guy some money to give us a ride home. Money for gas. I was in the back seat, you know, pulling around. Wasn't paying much attention to where we were at, what was going on. So we drive up to a gas station. He gets out, gets the gas, gets back in the car and starts driving. I get the car to pull over. You got my cash from gas station. Get out of here. What? Right. Like, you know, there was a roar, you know, yelling. I took it like as he needed, needed my help for some reason. You know, because this guy had to, you know, it was yelling. I just reached up there and wrapped my arm around the guy's throat and held on as tight as I could. It was pulling so hard and I could just feel his neck popping. And his head was coming back, but the rest of his body wasn't. And then um, I stabbed the guy. I thought all the way up until the time I turned myself in, I only stabbed him twice. It went so quick. I remember the blood just hit, spraying out, hitting the windshield and coming back on me and rolling down the back of the seat. They said I stabbed him about 20-something times, somewhere around there. Um, it's hard to say if I could have uh, done it in a different way. It all went too fast. I was scared. I was drunk. Um, my brother's in the car. Nobody's going to hurt my brother as long as I'm there. Throughout all our lives, out of all the family, he's the only one I've ever looked after. So there's no way that's going to happen. So I did what I thought at the time was necessary. Why did they feel it was necessary to kill him? I mean, from what the police told me, my brother's blood alcohol content was high. Um, there was no need to. There was no need to kill him. The truth about what actually happened during the final moments of David's life may never be known. The next day, his body was discovered in the blood-spattered car with multiple knife wounds in his throat, chest, and abdomen. For five months, the murder remained a mystery. Then, Rennie Rue was arrested on a completely unrelated charge of drunk driving and, at that time, consumed with guilt. 
he voluntarily confessed to the slaying of David Abbott. Before you go out haunting this Halloween, why not come into our place, if you dare? For all your Halloween haunting needs, theatrical makeup and accessories, consider, if you will, the JMS Smoke Shop, 284 Moody Street in Waltham. Open 9 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Monday through Saturday, 12 noon to 5 p.m. on Sunday. Silence will continue in a moment. In leading nail salons, the fresh manicure is the most requested fashion by women of means. Who else but Lee could make a French manicure beautiful, easy to apply, and so affordable? Introducing Lee Press-On Nails, the French manicure. Wear them as you do costume jewelry. They're as easy to put on and take off as regular Lee Press-On Nails with four extra nails, 24 in all for a perfect fit. In Parisian pink, central pay tan. Lee Press-On Nails, the French manicure. you learn in the kitchen is make it convenient. Put everything where you can get to it and use the right cookware for the job. So for roasting or baking, the cookware I use is a Reynolds oven cooking bag. It's such a convenient way to cook a meal because the meat bastes itself tender and juicy right inside the bag. And there's no messy pan or oven to clean up. Look for Reynolds oven cooking bags, the convenient cookware from the makers of Reynolds Wrap. It's a disturbing fact of life for millions of American men, baldness. Tonight, high hopes for a hair-raising drug called Rogaine. I saw a young man who was applying the medication and then go out jogging and have the medication come down his forehead in perspiration. When I saw hair growing out of his forehead, I knew that minoxidil can do something beneficial to hair regrowth when it is properly applied. I'm Jack Hines. Tune in tonight for part one of Hair-Raising Hopes on the news at 10. What events in the lives of these half-brothers led them to commit a spontaneous, violent murder? Parents are partially to blame. Not for their children doing what they do. Maybe for creating an environment that would allow them to do something they wouldn't like them to do. When Ernie was six years old, his parents divorced, and Ernie's happy life changed dramatically. Part of Ernie's background was to run, to avoid responsibilities. He was taught that between 7 and 14. He was taught that by his mother. There was no roots. There was no best friend when he grew up. He could have a best friend, but it could only be for eight months because you were going to move to a new school. I was alone, raising them quite a bit by myself, and they more or less had to do for themselves. You know, I'd wake them up, and they would have to get breakfast and take care of each other. At first, he was with a lot of guys, uh, a lot of them. And when I tried to explain how I felt about it, oh, you don't know nothing, you're just a little kid. That's what she would say. Uh, there was no foundation there. Her values were set wrong, so that's what I learned. You know, her thing was you get with a guy, you get what he's got, and then if there ain't no more, you move on. And that's how she did it. Ernie wanted to live with his father, but the court granted custody to his mother. Ernie expressed his feelings to live with his father, and I told him that if he needed his dad, there was a phone on the wall. He could call his dad at any time. When I go see Ernie that time, Ernie did not want me to go. I doubt if that's any different than any other child, except Ernie wanted to come with me. There's a point where you make a decision and you see what you're doing to the, ki to the child by seeing him. The decision was, Ernie, you've got to handle it. 
and I can't see you that often. Even though he said he wanted to be with us more, I don't think he, he did, but he didn't. You know, because he had things that he, he, was, he was always involved in things. Um, he used to collect little toy trains and stuff and uh, go around to these places that uh, had the tracks all set up. And he'd go camping and, you know, a lot of stuff he can't do with the little kid. But then again, he still wanted to be the father. Mabel's second marriage was to Carl Dill. The family environment they created was even more unstable and disruptive. When they were young, I tried to be the best father I possibly could. I, I didn't. I, I really thought that I was a good father. Um, today, I can see that I wasn't because I was, you know, I was crazy most of the time. I'd go for three or four months without drinking, but whenever I drank, I went nuts. It was like a battlefield, you know, when mom and dad were on together, you know, and uh, they got into a fight. I don't know what it was over. And I was only about five years old, and, uh, you know, they were knocking the shit out of each other, you know. Mom picked up the telephone, hit dad in the head, you know, and no statues flying across the house, no knickknacks. And uh, all I could do was hide under the bed, you know. And my brother took off and went and got cops, you know. And that was the, the only time that I really remember of uh, any battles between them. You know, other than my mother telling me, oh, your dad's son of a bitch, you know. Fuck alcoholic, he ain't good for nothing, you know. Things like that. And uh, I hated her for that sometimes. You know, because I love my dad, you know. I love her too, but... All I had to do was look at him. And they'd freeze in their tracks, like they were, I thought it was respect at the time, more fear than anything else. Because I did have a way of coming down on people strongly. I told them I was going to spank them, I beat them, I didn't spank them. I think had I not been drinking when I was raising my kids, I probably would have done a little bit different job of raising them. Maybe instilled those values that, that I really thought, feel are sacred today that I didn't then, you know. I, um, have tried to be more of a close close father than I was. When Carl Jr. was 11, Mabel divorced his father. Working two jobs to make ends meet, it became even more difficult for her to control her boy's behavior. I used to sneak in the middle of the night out to the refrigerator, grab a few beers, you know, take them back to my room. The drinking with the family on the holidays, everybody did it, you know. The kids were allowed one drink with the family. Um, as for him drinking elsewhere, I knew nothing about it. Then when I got into, you know, like junior high school and things like that, it started, you know, the, the marijuana, smoking it quite a bit, you know, every, every other day or so. And then there was, you know, like black beauties and things like that that the kids at school had, you know, I'd take them, you know. You know, it hurts to see kids on drugs and doing things like this. And so, you know, I take these drugs, you know, so I wouldn't have any feel feeling about what I was doing. You know, I didn't care. You know, I'd just go knock the shit out of the guy and then that was it. I never really saw the violent side of Carl. And uh, that's why it all came to a shock. As the brothers grew older, they took the drinking and violence they experienced at home to the streets. Carl was a bully in school and was once arrested for armed robbery. Ernie was arrested for assault, pimping, and drunk driving. By their teenage years, both boys had serious drinking problems. I think the biggest reason for boys riding up in prison was the drugs and the alcohol. Um, Ernie was in a group that did all this, and uh, he introduced his younger brother to it. My relationship with my mother isn't much. She, um, she's been here twice since I've been here. I've been here almost three years. Um, she writes once in a while. Um, we just haven't been that close, especially since this happened, because uh, this crime happened, because she blames me for my little brother being involved. 
I wasn't pushed into doing what I did. All so I had to do was say no, and that would have been it. I could have got out of the car and left, you know. But I wanted to be there with my brother. And when it happened, you know, I just reacted. By being in this film, the brothers knew their family would learn the truth. Carl wasn't just a passenger in the car that night. He actively participated in the murder of David Abbott. That's kind of hard to take. Because Junior's not the type to do things like that um, unless he was being pushed into it on drugs. I, I really don't. If he says he did it, I have to go with him and believe that he did this. But it's really hard to take because he's not that type of a kid. I might have been, you know, uh, tried to stop him going out because I knew that Ernie had been drinking that day. But I didn't know that my little baby had been drinking, you know, and uh, I didn't want to accept that my, my youngest son was that much like, my, like I was when I was his age. Do I feel personally responsible for Ernie murdering somebody? No, I do not. Do I feel embarrassed, hurt, sad? Do I feel crushed? I certainly do. Did I turn myself inside out when, I, when he wrote me a letter and for the first time in his life had to face me as a man? And in that letter he did and say, I took someone's life. It was hard, it was hard for him to say that as it was for me to read it. The worst part of it, I mean, for me, has been really the the um, agony of seeing those boys go through what they've had to go through. And I know that, you know, there's nothing on earth could replace that guy, but I wish we could, you know, I wish we could just snap it back four, four years ago, five years ago, and say, okay, let's start from here. The most horrible thing about my crime to me is, is the fact that I've learned that I could actually kill a man. I never thought I could do that before. And uh, I don't like it. I, I'm scared, you know, about doing all this time. I, you know, I'm only 20 years old. I mean, I have to be here until I'm 30 or 40. I don't know. And uh, that really scares me because when I get out, what's there going to be to do for an old man, you know? And uh, probably around that time, I'm not going to have too much of a family left. And that's what scares me. One day, Mabel's sons will be paroled. But Debbie will never see her brother again. What a waste. They don't realize it wasn't just David that they hurt. You know, it wasn't. I, I look at all the people and all the things that have come about because of this. I mean, they killed my brother. But it's changed my whole family's life. And I, I feel like I've, I've lost a big part of my life when David died. Carl Dill Jr. will be eligible for parole in the year 2000. Ernie Rue will be eligible for parole in the year 2011.